So in these remarks, I address perceptions. Perceptions of China's human rights record in the United States and uh, how they impact American politics in an election year. Uh, I, that's sort of how I understood the title. Um, and I'm not going to address whether these perceptions are accurate or not. The consensus view in Washington and among the American public is that China's human rights record is poor and getting worse. Um, I'm not going to address that in this forum. That can await another opportunity. Now, as, it, as has been pointed out already, American public opinion has never recovered from Tiananmen. Okay? Uh, in February 1989, uh, immediately before the spring demonstrations, the Gallup poll had 72% of Americans with a favorable view of China and 13% with an unfavorable view. Okay. A few weeks after June 4th, what we had was 34% with a favorable opinion and 54% with an unfavorable opinion. So on the favorable side, that's a 50 percentage point drop. Now, in the latest Gallup poll taken this year in February, 52% of American people had an unfavorable opinion of China. So in 1989, it was 54. Now it's 52. Now, uh, the American people who have been given a steady dose of stories attesting to rights violations in China have not been allowed to, ha to forget what happened in Tiananmen Square. A Pew poll taken in May of this year uh, gave a remarkably similar result to the uh, Gallup poll. In that poll, 55% of Americans have an unfavorable opinion of China. But here's the interesting question. In that poll, Americans were asked, does the Chinese government, in your opinion, respect the individual freedoms of the Chinese people? 80% said no. OK. All right, so uh, distaste for China's human rights records is reflected in the two parties' platforms. So I took a look at the platforms. I read through them. Uh, the Democrats limit mention of human rights to one sentence. Quote, we will promote greater respect for human rights, including the rights of Tibetans, end quote. The GOP platform, which mentions, by the way, China 21 times, followed by Russia 10 times is far more critical, and I quote, liberalizing policies have been abruptly reversed. Dissent brutally crushed. Religious persecution heightened. The internet crippled. A barbaric population control two-child policy of forced abortions and forced sterilizations continued. The cult of Mao revived. Critics of the regime have been kidnapped by its agents in foreign countries. The platform goes on to claim that cultural genocide continues in Tibet and Xinjiang, and the promised autonomy of Hong Kong has been eroded. Now, the statements of the Democratic candidate, Hillary Clinton, going back 20 years, have been sharply critical of China's human rights record, whereas the platform of the party is not. I find that interesting. In a thinly veiled swipe at China, Hillary Clinton declared that women's rights are human rights. Her speech was censored. That was in September 1995. She has boasted of standing up for American values by saving Chen Guangcheng from China's state security apparatus in 2012, an incident that infuriated and embarrassed China's leaders. In a tweet marking the September 2015 United Nations Summit on Women's Rights, co-hosted by Mr. Xi Jinping, Clinton called out Xi for hypocrisy, saying his co-hosting the summit after the Chinese government jailed five feminists was shameless. That didn't play well, I understand, in Beijing. <laughs> by contrast, <laughs> And again, remember, the GOP platform is very harsh. By contrast, Donald Trump has been remarkably tolerant of China's human rights record. 
you may be familiar with his 1990 Playboy interview. I know you guys never look at Playboy, but he gave an interview in 1990, and he was asked about China. Quote, when the students poured into Tiananmen Square, the Chinese government almost blew it. Then they were vicious. They were horrible. But they put it down with strength." End quote. More recently, uh, during the uh, GOP presidential debate, uh, Trump referred to the Tiananmen protests as a riot, much to the consternation uh, of Chinese dissidents. But listen to this one. In Trump's speech on foreign policy in August, he declared that he would end the policy of promoting democracy and presumably human rights, and declared that any country that wants to work with the United States in fighting radical Islamic terrorism, which is the term that the Chinese government happens to use for what's going on in Xinjiang, any such government will be an ally of the United States. I cannot remember in my lifetime a candidate for president referring to China as an ally. This is music to Beijing's ears. While the Chinese government is not happy with Trump's declared intention to impose a 45% tariff on Chinese goods, <laughs> they happen to doubt he'll actually be able to do it, I have no question that Beijing prefers Trump to Clinton when it comes to human rights. Human rights in China is not a basic or a major issue on the campaign trail. It rarely comes up. Witness Monday night's debate. Donald Trump slammed China on trade and currency. He called uh, America China's piggy bank and suggested that China uh, might be behind the hacking of the DNC site uh, and also suggesting that maybe China should invade North Korea. So, I mean, that, that worked its way in. And of course, we have heard before that Hillary has boasted of a 50% increase in exports. Not a single mention of human rights. Not one. However, it is still a factor. Interestingly, in some battleground states, for instance, Ohio, Michigan, and North Carolina, in these states, many of the electorate blame China for job losses. Now, note that Mr. Trump mentioned both Ohio and Michigan in the same breath as China in the opening uh, salvos of the debate on Monday night. Right. Now, Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown has frequently cited China's poor record on labor rights as a root cause for China's competitive advantage that has led to the loss of jobs. Unfortunately for the Democrats, Hillary Clinton is the nominee, not Sherrod Brown. Despite her recent change of heart on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, she has been a strong supporter of free trade agreements with countries like China for many years. Trump is leading in the most recent polls in both North Carolina and Ohio, and I just saw the RCP on Michigan. He's gaining on Clinton in Michigan. Now, I've been working on securing the release of political and religious prisoners in China for more than a quarter century. I testify to Congress on average once every two years and am, and am in daily contact with members of Congress, their staff, and the administration. I have, come, I have concluded that when it comes to human rights in China, Americans and their elective representatives do not, generally speaking, think in abstract terms, like respect for rule of law, and even religious freedom. Not to say they don't think about it at all. When you tear down 1,500 crosses in Zhejiang, it makes an impact. Uh, however, they do think in terms of human beings and the impact of Chinese policies on the lives of people. You know, you got politics, policy, you need to put people up there. As I have often said, you cannot talk about human rights without talking about human beings. 
A quick review of the role played by victims of alleged persecution bear out this observation. At the 1992 Democratic National Convention, Tiananmen protesters, leaders, took to the podium and denounced China on human rights. The same convention endorsed the plank calling for the United States to strip China of its trade status. More recently, the case of the blind lawyer Chen Guangcheng was a factor in the 2012 presidential election. At a time when Chen was being sheltered in the American embassy, Republican candidate Mitt Romney called the handling of the Chun case by the Obama administration a day of shame and a dark day for freedom. O Obama surrogates attacked Romney as unfit for president because of these remarks. How am I doing there? Doing good? All right. Ten more minutes? Seven. Seven. Oh. Romney's words, however, played an important part in securing the Chun family's relocation to the United States. Not long after Romney attacked the, the Obama administration, Hillary Clinton, in China to attend the Strategic and Economic Dialogue, had a meeting with State Councilor Dai Bing Guo. She drew Dai's attention to Romney's remarks and to Chun's telephone testimony to a Republican-led congressional committee. In her own book, she, she relates that she argued that it was in China's best interest and in our best interests for uh, China to let Chun leave. Her appeal worked. While American politicians, including two presidential candidates, rarely talk about human rights in China, that could change if a court in Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region convicts and imprisons an American businesswoman by the name of Sandy Fan Gillis and sends her to prison for spying on behalf of the American government on China. Her, tra her trial has been delayed, probably because of the G20 meeting. No date has been set. We think it'll take place in October. Ms. Van Gillis is an American citizen who has tirelessly worked to promote good relations between the United States and China for more than 20 years as president of the Sun Jun Houston Sister City Association, one of the biggest such associations in the United States. Among other things, she introduced Yao Ming to the Houston Rockets, a very prominent businesswoman. Well, uh, in March of last year, she was taken into custody at the border with Macau by state security agents. And she was brought back to Nanning, uh, where she was placed under something called residential surveillance in a designated location, a coercive measure uh, that has been condemned <coughs> by the United Nations Working Group on Enforced or Arbitrary Disappearance and the Committee Against Torture as a violation of international law. For the first time in its 25-year history, the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention ruled that an American citizen has been arbitrarily detained in China in defiance of international law. If she is convicted and sent to prison, she will be the first American in prison for spying for the United States since Jack Downey in 1973, all right, 43 years ago. That may actually wind up entering campaign rhetoric, in my humble opinion. Whoever wins, and I'm winding up now, I think I have about four minutes left. Whoever wins, and now I get to the policy part, right? Whoever wins the presidential race, the administration taking office in January will have to decide whether or not, and in what form, the bilateral human rights dialogue with China takes place. There have been 19 such sessions since the early 1990s, and a session has taken place every year of the Obama administration. It will not take place this year. This year, Chinese diplomats have made it clear 
that any country that signed the March 2016 joint statement criticizing China on human rights at the Geneva meeting of the Human Rights Council would not be given a dialogue. And so far, the UK, Germany, well, Germany has been advised, but they won't get one. The UK, Germany, Australia, no. Only one country, Switzerland, and they didn't sign the joint statement. Now along comes the United States. For our part, I speak now as an American, as far as the American government is concerned, there's no enthusiasm for talking about human rights with China. They don't think any progress has been made, and it's not worth doing. For my part, I hope the dialogue will take place in future years. The dialogue remains the most important forum for raising human rights concerns. It provides an opportunity to raise scores, hundreds of individual cases. Long prisoner lists are prepared and handed over. And systemic issues, of course, like the NGO law, uh, are also dis discussed. But I think the value of the dialogue is precisely that it gives us the opportunity to remember to the Chinese government the names of those who speak truth to power and who give life to the words of Milan Kundera that the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. Thank you very much.